in this area, in Washington, D.C. area, and in a Christian family, and uh, went to school and did everything like most people did in those days and of my age and time. Of course, I came in a time much long ago. Maybe some of you have only seen it in black and white. Oh, it's kid like that. Actually, we had color back then. But the point is that I'm from a society and a culture and a, uh, a background that's very familiar with the importance that <clears throat> music in particular is given, having been greatly and deeply involved in it myself as a professional even at one time. And that's where my early education was done. I have a graduate, a, a, a bachelor's degree actually in performance of music. And what that means is that I had to learn music theory, you know, um, how to read, write, arrange, and so forth. And learn a bit about music history, um, a little bit about psychology of music, along with other things. A little bit more than just having to count the four. So we did. Used to make that joke. Most people think musicians just gotta know how to count the four. But it's a little bit more to that. So having indulged in that and done that from a young age, from the age from about maybe the first piano lessons, from age 10, all the way through college, this was my life. But also something else occurred at that time. Something else occurred at that point in my life where I felt a certain lacking during that time. And I mention that because many of us have experienced, and I have experienced, and many people experience and swear by it, that they, through their uh, involvement and their enjoyment of music, it gives them a lot of fulfillment. It actually makes them feel even spiritual, sort of spirituality. You'll hear people even refer to certain musicians as prophets because of their lyrics, because of their, you know, ability to touch the heart, because of their message. So I definitely experienced that and went through that and felt that growing up. And like anything, if you grow up with it, obviously <clears throat> it becomes a part of you. And this is another aspect maybe we'll talk about a little bit later, and that is the effects it has on a person, its impact on their thinking, uh, on their spirituality, on, in their, on their inner state, the emotional state, as well as their intellectual state. Music has an impact on all of that, and this is what makes it so powerful. So I say all of that, again, just to give you uh, an inkling or to say that I'm not speaking as a person who's unfamiliar or who was not involved or detached from this particular thing. And I think actually most people have some connection, whether they go to the extent of being, you know, educated in it to a higher degree, or they go into as a profession. Many people that's their pastime, that's they're indulged and involved in it anyway. I mean, even myself, many most people I knew, the radio was on, or a record player was playing. You know what a record is? Yeah, yeah, mom, yeah, yeah. Brian. <laughs> Back in the stage 45. The point is, people are involved in it. They're, they're listening to it all the time. They wake up to it, they go to sleep by it. Right? They do everything to it. They work by it, they play by it, everything. So most people in this culture, in the society, in many cultures actually, it's not just a Western thing, are deeply involved and heavily attached to to music, it has a strong attachment to them. Every culture has its songs, every culture has its folklore, every culture has its music, its art, and so on and so forth. The, it's a matter of degree sometimes, how deep people get into it. It's a matter of degree. It might be slightly different. You might find people have biases or prejudices. So it has to do to where they come up. So for example, to my ear, or to someone who's maybe grown up in the West, their ear is attuned to a certain type of melody of melodic, certain type of tone. So they hear something from somewhere else, it doesn't strike them the same way. It, it, it strikes them totally differently. 
So if I hear certain things or certain people hear certain things, they, it's like it might as well be, you know, like nail scratching on a blackboard. But to someone from there, it's, that was fantastic. They love it. And of course, there are different styles and types of music and so forth. All of that is, the point is here is that just the fact that it's pervasive, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. Not just in America, not just in the West. Um, maybe what we see is because of the amount of wealth that is generated from the West, in particular the United States, we find the indulgence maybe to a higher degree. We find its status to a higher degree. But I can tell you of a time where it was not looked upon highly. It was not looked upon so much, but it has always been a part of the culture. I mean, from day one. From the people who came from Europe and settled here, they brought their songs with them. And the people who were already here, they had theirs too. And people had their instruments, and people had their lyrics, and people had this is universal, if you will, and worldwide. So obviously, uh, having come through that, and um, then feeling that something missing and searching and eventually finding Islam and then hearing or finding out what Islam what Islam's position is toward that was very important to me. Because I was making my living that way. Now to back up a little bit, there's a disclaimer I want to make. And really I don't think it's absolutely necessary to make, but I just want to say it is that I'm not here to give fatal personally. I can't give a fatal or ruling in Islam. I'm not qualified. And it goes without saying, anyone who knows me, or anyone who hears me, knows that I am not a scholar. I have been a diary, I have been a teacher, I have been an administrator, and I have been practicing this, this dean for a while. I mean, that, uh, since I have turned to the, almost to practice since I've been an adult. And I have had an opportunity to do a little study overall to sit with some of the yeah. and to hear many lectures, and to read books, and, to, and so forth. And a little bit of facility with the Arabic language to be able to hear from those scholars who are real scholars, true scholars, who break things down. But myself, it's clear that I'm not going to even pretend. This is why I don't allow people to say Sheikh Abu Qab, except the fact that I'm old enough. Yeah, from that point of view. But when it comes to knowledge, no, no, I, I'm very strict about that because it can be misleading. And another thing with the reason this is important because there are people who are white. They call us to Islam. They are inspiring in their speech. They're very good. Many people listen to them, but people will undo pressure on them and ask them to give Islamic rulings, and it's not their place. People need to know their lane. So I'm telling you I know my name, inshallah. And there's a general rule that the less you know, the more you're likely to make mistakes. Especially when we were talking about representing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messengers say. If we're saying what the slang says, we have to be very careful about this. At the same time, even if one has knowledge, the more one speaks and the more one is active, the more likely they're to make mistakes. The human beings. And alhamdulillah, the saving grace, the saving principle, beautiful principle of our religion, is that we know its source, its deen, the deen source, is always, we're always able to refer to it. We know that the authority in Islam is the Quran, the Book of Allah, in the Arabic language, and the Sunnah of the Prophet, وسلم, they authenticate statements, actions, task approvals of our Prophet. So the Lord said, this is Islam. This is where Islam is contained. This is what we all look towards. And this is what the scholars look towards. And then we look at, of course, how were the people who were with the Prophet Sallallahu who were with Muhammad Islam, how did they practice the religion? This is a principle I'm trying to set now, and if there's any disagreement with this principle, we need to stop and get this clear that the basis for which I come from, or try to, 
is on this foundation that the deen is from the Quran, it is from the authenticated Sunnah, it is then from the companions, the best of the Muslims, who according to the statement, the authenticated statement of the Prophet were his companions. And he said, you know, to take from his Sunnah and to take from the Sunnah of the Khulafa Rashidin after him, the guy, the Rabbi guy, Khalifa, Khulafa. And he even pointed to say, take your deen from these two. He's pointing to Abu Bakr and Umar. And the Khulafa Rashidun, by consensus of the Ummah, are considered to be Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. And then some people say the fifth of the Khulafa Rashidin, Abdul Aziz, who was the later Khalifa, the grandson of Umar. But the point is this the criteria is that those who were closest. Those who were in the generation of the Prophet, okay? He said, be upon the religion or upon my sunnah and, the, and, and on the way of the best of generations. Then those who follow them and those who follow them, and he stopped. And so that is taken and understood to mean the Sahaba, his Qarni, his generation, the people who were around him, who followed him, and then those who followed them, or their students, their children, and those who followed them, the Tabi Tabi, so the Sahaba, the Tabi, and the Tabi Tabi. We look to those first early generations as authoritative. And the positions they took, we look at them first. Because they were the closest to the source, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, this is a rational argument I'm giving you here. It's a logical one. I haven't, well, I've mentioned a few hadith, but the point is, uh, and here's another very important thing. What I'm saying, or what I'm saying is from, again, it's not just from myself, it's from what has been said to me, taught to me, and taught to many by the scholars of the world. Those people who look at those evidences, who understand the Arabic of the Qur'an, who look at the actions and the statements of the companions, who look at what was done by their students and their students afterwards, the Tabi'in and the Tabi'in, they look at all of that together to come to the understanding that they then break down and pass on to us. Their scholarship is what determines, okay, what is they are able to look and see, okay, this was authentically stated by the Prophet Sallallahu This is the understanding or the meaning of this or that ayah because it's based on statements of the companions and statements of the Prophet Sallallahu as well as the Arabic language. This is how we understand the Quran. The Quran gives the tafsir of itself in many places, but we don't totally rely on the Arabic language. We rely on the explanation of the prophets of the Lord and them. But how do you know that? How do you know what's authentic? That's, there's a process of authenticating that, which was done by great scholars, Muhammadin, people like Imam Al Bukhari, Imam Muslim, and Nasai, and Tirmidhi, Ibn Imam Imam Ahmed, and so forth. We know about these things, or I think you're familiar with these things. That, in other words, scholarship now comes into this. But we always know, again, the saving grace is that we don't know scholar is absolutely infallible. There's none more considered infallible in this deed, except who? Allah is messenger. So there are people who can come later on, no matter how knowledgeable they are, they may be at some given area or some point, they can't be mistaken. And they said this about themselves, like Imam Malik, Imam Dar Hijra, the great Imam, and others said similar statements like, like this. 
He said, there's none more perfect in this religion except the one who is in this grave and who is sitting in the Prophet's Masjid and was pointing toward the house of the Prophet Sallallahu saying, this is the one who is infallible. So, statements like this from Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Muhammad Idris al-Shafi'i, Abu Hanifa, these, they all made these types of statements. And I'm kind of revising this as a foundation, first of all, because what we come up or what we mentioned today with regards to this issue of music, we will look to them first as far as the technicality of what music is. And what I hope to offer you, and I'm going to, you know, I looked at also this essay. I heard it was, I was sold to me, it was sold to me, it was sold to me by some people. as a, a discussion. <laughs> so, a discussion means some interaction. So I got some questions for you. I'm not going to let you ask me. <laughs> I'm always trying to seek out of this. Because I'm not mufti. What I, what I mean, and now you'll see what I mean. There are some questions and an opportunity that I also saw this as. You know, many times we don't get a chance to speak with the youth directly, and we make assumptions, and vice versa, assumptions are made. So it's, it's, it's always good to be able to be open and to be, to be honest and to lay it out there. Because what happens if you don't, it lingers. Or if you have that question, believe somebody else has it in their chest as well. And then if we can hash it out and work it out and bring some statement to bear regarding it, we will do that. And if we can't, we say we don't have knowledge to say, I don't know. So, I hope to have some interaction and some discussion, real discussion. But there's certain things that are not open to discussion. Or let's put it like this, it's only open to discussion if there is a lack of understanding about something. And I, what I mean is this, I just mentioned a few things out of principles that are foundations that for me are unshakable. They are, they are not, there's no discussion because the evidence is clear. It's clear cut. So I'm not going to argue or discuss whether or not the Quran is the book of Allah. If that's the unnecessary discussion, maybe it's another time and place. But I don't think we need that discussion, at least right now, before us. The fact that the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad is authoritative, there's no need for discussion right now. Again, unless you don't understand that, someone, how is that, or how do, why do you say that? But I'm making an assumption right now, I'm telling you where my assumptions are. What I don't think necessarily needs discussion. Uh, the fact that we look to the early generations who were first and foremost the companions around the Prophet Muhammad as their positions and their opinions and their statements carrying great weight that they were not in general as a rule that they don't speak without having especially when talking of issues of the unseen when talking about certain issues, they can't come from themselves. They will only do so as a principle that they will only say such things if there's something that they took from the Prophet Muhammad and that they're considered adil, they're considered fair, they're considered just, uh, they're considered trustworthy. The companions are considered trustworthy. Now when you start to get the next generation and the next generation, more examination has to be done. Just like, frankly, after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu examination had to be done. Even the companions, they wouldn't just accept from one another right away sometimes. There's famous examples where, uh, you know, one of the companions would hear something 
from another companion that he hadn't heard himself from the promise of the son. So he said, you're lying. Some of them were tough. <laughs> he said, we're going to go back to it now. So the principle of going back to the prophets of some is actually established by them. And verifying. Like, where did you hear it and when did you hear it? That was actually something established then. But the writing of the hadith and then this process of sifting through weak and strong, of course that's something that became really, really necessary as time went on. Because people would say anything to support themselves. They know that the principle, the unshakable principle that the statement of the Prophet is law, it is the deed. We people realize, of course, then if we say something, if we say that the Prophet said it, we can perhaps get away with certain things. This is reality. The further the people got away from that time, some lack of, lack of ethics and honesty comes in. And sometimes it actually was people had a good intention, but they did it wrongly. They wanted to encourage good action. They wanted to encourage righteousness. And they may say that something is from the prophets or something that wasn't. So the point is that this verification had to come in. And this again goes back to the great works of great scholars. It didn't start with Imam Bukhari. But he is well known as the having the collection which is considered of the highest grade of authenticity. It's not the first book of Hadith. It's not the only book of Hadith. It doesn't contain every Sahih Hadith. I think you all know this, but I'm saying this for a purpose. Just to set this foundation, to establish it, that this is where we're coming from where we narrate, inshallah, anything on this issue, inshallah. But, uh, what we find, what we find, if we do a little research, and by the way, I, sh I should say this, this is another important thing. When we sit together and we talk about any issue, when you, me, any of us sit and listen or talk about any issue of Islam, or when we Consider ourselves wanting to find the, the what does Islam say about something? We have to have the correct niya, the correct intention. We have to have ikhlas. Meaning that we don't come with seeking something to be said that coincides with what we already believe. Not necessarily. We, we have to, as, as a friend of mine says, empty the cup. We be, in other words, we should approach things with a willingness to accept the truth wherever that may come from, even if it's something we didn't know. And it may coincide with our inclination or not. But what we want to be is as the people as who were described in uh, Surah and Nisa, if I'm not mistaken, you can correct me as Hafid, where Allah says, if you differ upon anything, if you have controversy about something, and I noticed that this was kind of mentioned in the uh, promotion of this event, discuss the controversy around music. So if we do have such an issue, who do we take it to? Allah and His Messenger. It's just, it's from the ayat itself, the Book of Allah. And it goes on to say, uh, to take it to Allah and His Messenger, and then to send it to Islam that you then submit to that and you don't feel anything in the heart that you are, in other words, accepted of the rule of Allah and His Messenger. Okay? This is a sign of the believer. 
that if Allah says it, if the messenger says it, we hear, we obey. This is a high level of man, actually. Even if you don't know all of the, the intricacies or the secrets to an issue, if we know that this is what Allah states, and we know that this is what the messenger stated, right? And it's clear, then the highest level of Iman is to say, that's enough for me. And there's a lot of issues like this in Islam, actually. So we may, therefore, afterwards, we might find out there are some wisdoms, that we may find that there's some secrets, some, some very deep things that go along with that. But initially, it's because Allah and His message just say it. And for example, there's nobody who, well, I don't know anyone who argues against the prohibition of eating lahm khazir, pork, pig meat. Right? Because it's a clear act that makes it forbidden. But maybe later on we may find out there's wisdom in it. For many reasons, spiritual, health reasons, and so on and so forth. But initially, the basic reason we don't eat pork is not because of the cholesterol or the salt content and all that stuff. It's because Allah created. So this is actually our approach. So going back to my statement about having a plus, is that if we if it's made clear to us. And that's an issue, it should be made clear. It's clear to us, made, made clear that Allah and His Messenger have said something, or that there's a consensus of the companions, or a consensus of the great scholars of the Ummah who broke all this stuff down and examined it and went into depth about it. If they have come to a conclusion, then who are we? There's really no need to argue about this. It really shouldn't be controversial because it's an issue that has been decided and agreed upon by the best of the people. Does that mean there's no disagreement at all? Let's be honest, no. There is. In other words, you can always find a divergent opinion. So what we need to do is to examine the, the weight or the substantiation for that divergent opinion. And it wasn't, is it based on? Is there some strength, some to it? And then, again, it gets back to us that after all is said and done, if it's been made clear to us that something is a part of Islam, are we ready to do it? Are we committed to following it? This is why we want to strive and struggle with our nests regarding. For sure. And I know this is actually one of the reasons that there's controversy. It's not that the ruling, there's a controversy on the ruling. The controversy is us, in us, because we're so attached to something, and it's so widespread, as we said earlier, it's so commonplace, what do we, and it's so much a part of us, that it's like we can't even imagine life without it, or well, how could you not indulge when everybody, even quote-unquote righteous people that we see, who we consider righteous, then it's like the controversy comes from that. Uh, this issue is obviously is an old issue. It's not a new one. It's been around for a long time. <laughs> and a long time in, in your terms, for example. And <laughs> you know, it, it's because actually it's many centuries old, but I, I was just reminiscing. And I got an old publication 
This publication is 1998. Was any of you or any of you around in 1998? There's one old guy here. So it's interesting because I, I just picked it up on page nine. And by the way, this just is it's called Huda. <laughs> this is El Huda School, but <laughs> this was called Huda Magazine. Uh, it's actually a newsletter. Put out many years ago. And on page nine, it goes into this fatwa regarding music. And it depended mostly upon the uh, it's a translation of <coughs> excuse me <coughs> of um, statements made by the great scholar Rahimullah uh, uh, Muhammad Nasr al Din al Bain who was a muhaddith who was known as contemporarily as one of the greatest scholars of the Hadith. Again, no one's ma'asum, no one is infallible. But he's generally agreed upon as a great scholar of hadith. So these scholars here or, uh, took some people, uh, translated his statements. One, um, we may know Dr. Muhammad al Jibali because we have some people here who are actually related to him and we have used his books. Anyway, it goes through a whole thing. Question and answer, and again translating the statements of the scholar shows that in the Muslim world, this was all in Arabic before, in the Muslim world itself, amongst Arabic speaking, reading, understanding people, Muslims for generations, they had questions. And they asked, and they brought up issues, they brought up objections about this issue. And uh, the scholar, he talks about some of the issues in Fatawa that actually were for or in favor of music and where they went wrong. And he talks about the reason for a prohibition of music. So he's obviously taking the position that there's a prohibition. And then he goes down to a list of things. So what I, I'm not going to go through all of it. I may refer to it. But just to, the point is that to show you that this, this has been a constant issue for a long time, contemporarily and previously. And scholars have had to take the time then to try to explain it in terms that the people can understand and relate to. And it shows that they're not unaware of the difficulties that people may find, especially with dealing from the perspective of hearing that there is a prohibition. So uh, that's just one thing. Another book which I have, uh, I could not find my hard copy. I'm going to suggest it to you, and maybe I, I can copy this. This one over, by the way, scan or something. Preserve it. It's turning brown. It's about to crumble away. Um, another book, which I read myself many decades ago, a few decades ago when it first came out, was by a, a brother who was a Canadian. He's a Canadian, and he is, he's passed away, right? He was a student of knowledge, um, you know, born and raised in the West as well. And so he took it upon himself to write what I think is a very easy to read and understand treatise. But you gotta put some effort in people. So here's my, here's my first question to you. How many of you have taken the time to look up this issue and read a ruling about it? Okay, a few of you. Okay. So I encourage you to do this. Like if you're serious about getting to the bottom of things, you can't just depend upon people telling you. You should, you need to train yourself to have patience and to take time yourself to read. 
And then don't just read what agrees with you. What you already think, what you think is already going to support what you need feeling. You have to read with an open mind. But you understand the basis by which you can understand whether something is true or not. This is a key. Like how do I know something is truthful? It's correct. If they give references and a clear explanation from the Quran and the authentic hadith, that's the starting point. If it's just philosophizing, or if it's just people using rhetoric, then that may have its place, but that's not evidence. Evidence is qala Allah, qala Rasul, qala Sahaba, qala Ulama. Is that clear? But you need to put on effort, brothers and sisters. Take a little time. You know, we're living in an age now that wasn't back in these days. So this is a long article. You sit there and you read because that's what you had to do. Or maybe you had, maybe somebody have a cassette tape. You don't remember what a cassette tape huh? <laughs> Maybe. But it certainly wasn't like now. You pick that up. You click YouTube. You type in ruling on music the way you get it. And the problem is, someone can be very dynamic and engaging. They may be very, you know, their speech may be beautiful. But that's not evidence. Evidence is This is always, no matter what. And so that intention that is lost in us has to be there. Because it could be that we hear all the evidence in the world. But at the end of it all, oh, we go right back to whatever we were doing. So the purpose, or your purpose should be here, as well as myself, is that we want to be the type of people who, when we hear that Allah has mentioned have decided something that we submit. And then we strive. We strive. And we may fall short sometimes. And this is where I will bring my personal experience. When I um, became a Muslim, as I mentioned to you, back in those times, way back when, and I was making my living this way, uh, I met someone after returning to this area and it was just a gathering with uh, some brothers who was a, I don't know, a guitar or something. And you know, in those days I, I looked much different than I did now. It's much smaller. And the brother said to me when he found out I was a musician, he said, come on. <laughs> I'm like, what, what did I do? I was like, what did I do? And he said, you know, you know the music is haram. He started to say this. Now at the time it didn't register. Like I I was literally maybe not even a year or Muslim. And and I noticed another brother who was the host, he did this. No, he said, he said, he did this. Like, chill. This is a new brother. <laughs> Give him a break, you know. Don't don't just jump on him. You see? Which I appreciate. But it was my first inkling that something was wrong. It wasn't cool what I was doing. It was an inkling that from the Islamic point of view. But no details. Bef along at the same time, around that same time. I also could feel, I could understand there was something wrong. Now this is another angle. This is not purely a technical, you know, evidence thing. I'm telling you though, you don't need a scholar sometimes to tell you certain things. If we're honest. If I'm making my money in bars, 
clubs, concert halls, and the money is generated from alcohol sales and other types of entertainment, which I know even then was haram. I start to feel this, this is not something, it's not something I want to maybe stay in as much as I love it. Like it was a nail in the coffin. Stoop, one nail. I mean, my money is coming from alcohol sales. If I'm sitting, I'm playing in the club, I got my coffee on. I think I'm giving that one. When I'm playing, everybody's jumping up and dancing. With down on my head. I got Muhammad on Rasulullah on the side of my amplifier. Well, people drinking and having discussions and having illicit relationships. Who's the Dow being done? And I realized this. And when I got to take a break, where are I going to take my break? At the bar. And even at that time, I, I, I think I knew that you know, Muslims are not even supposed to sit at a table where alcohol is served. You know that? We're not to sit at a table where alcohol is served. I'm sitting in a bar. So unless I could go, unless I go out on the street, my clothes are filled with smoke at the end of the night and alcohol, the smell. And I miss a shot. And it's almost five times the fudge by the time I'm heading home. And if I try to make up a shot, in a little bit of Arabic, my prayer I'm trying to make, but what I'm hearing in my back of my mind is whatever it is that I guess I can explain. <laughs> it's conflicting. It's messing me up. I can't even stand in the prayer and concentrate. Or in the room next door, I'm hearing ruckus going on. Or if I'm in some kind of costume having to change, and the female in the group is changing there too. As a Muslim, can I stay in this situation? As a living? Let's put that aside. Forget that part. This, this, there's different types. Maybe I could have been just a concert artist. So we just play it, but this doesn't usually happen until you get to a certain level. Don't have to go to the bars, only play it. Theaters. Again, what's happening to me? I have to put so much effort, and I'm telling you the effort it takes to be a high level musician is very, very intense. You become a, you're really a, a student of it, and you're really trying to advance, if you will. The point is, it takes a lot of effort and time and uh, to, to reach a higher level. Where's the time I have to learn about my religion, my new religion? How can I really absorb it? Or oh, I feel the conflict when I'm reading about, you know, the Sierra, or if I'm reading about what Islam says about the treatment of women, or if I see what Islam is saying about relationships between people, and I see what I'm witnessing every night, strunk, another coffin, nail in the coffin. And my heart is so agitated, you know, in Al-Qayyid, Rahimahullah, he said, if you see a man in the sala and he's moving around, he's rocking back and forth, and he's looking all around, he said that, you know, if his heart was settled, he would be settled. And I guess I'm standing there, I'm literally feeling whatever it was that was getting up there. This is interfering with my spiritual well being, and intellectually as well. There's an interference, and this is something I, I'm going kind of skipping over the technicality of the ruling to mention of some real effects. Because this is a part of the discussion that 
scholars bring when they start talking about you know, the impact, the effects of listening to music. They start telling you from personal experience. And I'm, I'm not unique in this. I don't by any means think I'm unique in this. I mean, I think there are people who are casual listeners who feel something. And it gets to the point where, okay, if you want to have a, a lift, and you're feeling down, and you want to feel better, you turn it on a thumb. You play your favorite artist. If you want to feel a certain way. And as musicians, we learned we can play certain things. And most musicians know this, the fact that I have the money. They know. What chords to play, what rhythm, what's tempo to play to get you to cry, to laugh, to jump up and down. Now you've seen it. Sometimes all it takes is a few little lines of something and everybody starts. That's all it takes. There is actually a science to this. Some people have studied this. Certain frequencies. Why get the bass is so heavy? Why do you think that back beat on the drums is a certain way? It's, it's designed to impact you. And this is the problem. That this starts to interfere with what? What should be closest to as Muslims? The revelation of Allah. Some of us cannot sit to you know, memorize Quran. Or to sit patiently to read through an issue. It is hard for us. But we can sit for hours with music. And we can learn lyrics just like that. Some people can learn lyrics like. Not to mention people who spit bars. Rappers. They can rap about anything. In fact, there are people who are famous. Give me, give me three words about anything. Ice cream, jelly, coconuts. I'll make a rap. <laughs> really. Not to mention other things. The point is this. This is there's something in the makeup of the human being that responds to rhythm, to melody, to rhyme. All these are elements of music. Okay? And these things can be manipulated. Now, with a tool that powerful, that impactful, who do you think we use it? Who do you think would find that to be one of the most effective ways to divert people from revelation? Huh? Shaykhan. He said it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Without oh, doubt. I mean, this is just the bottom line. And everyone, I think, if you're, they're honest with themselves, they feel this. And it's and music is, uh, of course, it's, it's also a component of other entertainment. Correct? In fact, it's used as a diversion for, from even things that is just are shopping. You go into the mall, music is playing. Why? There's no clocks in the mall. You know why that is? Music is playing in the mall. In certain stores, there's a reason for that. And somebody had a question about that, actually. But the point is, there is a rationale. There's a there's a science behind that, folks. It's intentional. Um, yes, people do learn through music. You know, powerful messages get messages get sent. And a lot of times you'll hear people talking about this issue. And they're right that, you know, there's a lot of negativity that's obvious. You know, the misogyny. They're talking about women in degrading ways. All is very sexual. Everything is about that. Everything is about materialism. 
what you can get, who you can get, how you can get, how much you can get, when, where you can get. You know, braggadocio, people bragging and boasting, unrealistic expectations, frankly, straight up worship of people. And, you know, our grandparents, everybody says, you, you youngsters, this generation, your music is so this and that. Well, it's always, every generation is like that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you listen to Frank Sinatra and Big Crosby or whatever, but they, were, they might have been more subtle. <laughs> but the lyrics were still all about drinking, having a good time, love and love and romance and all this. And yes, it became as Morale, morals degenerate, people become more explicit. And now we're living in an age where it's actually no thing. So you guys, some of you have lived, you've only known that. Unless you're, you hear some old stuff, you know, um, it used to be only a certain segment of musicians singers and sing in a certain way. It was, it was put in a corner in the, into a very small pocket. People who were very lewd or explicit. You know, almost no one used curse words. Even then, they, they were more subtle, like they would allude, they do us all double entendre. You know, when you're talking about sex, but you use other words. That's what they would do. They use, you know, symbolism on it. But we know, everybody knows what they're talking about. They were much more subtle. Now, no. It's blatant, bold, upfront, and nasty. And there's not a Muslim who has half a mind who doesn't know that that's wrong. But the, but the problem is, when it is not so obvious. And the people feel, because they get spiritual uplift, emotional, it does affect the emotions. It is designed to, it can change your mood. And actually therapy is done according with music, musical therapy. Changes the mood of people. We are in this environment. You are not considered cultured without music. You're not considered educated unless you know a certain amount about music, certain types of music. You're not considered or, or educated. Like, it's very, 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 very much a part of people's lives. It's, it's practically inescapable. That's a reality that we live in. And I would go so far as to say, even in the Muslim world, and I've lived there for some time, that's another part of my background. Not long after I had these experiences that I'm talking about here, I left the country. And I went to live in Egypt for some time. And after that, I came back, and then I went back again. I lived in Saudi Arabia. So I lived up until not long ago, I actually lived a lot of my life in the Muslim world. So I know what people like. And I know what people did. And everybody's into it. I mean, it's all over. Right there in the heart of people say the land of talking. It's always been there. Maybe a little more on the ground. Not as open as it is now. But it's not like, uh, the reason I mention that because I know I've heard people say, oh, well, see, they don't know nothing about this over there. That's not true. Come on, man. Where do you think this quote-unquote civilization, civilization began over there? <laughs> you know. So people have their cultural attachments. It's not something peculiar to us living in the United States, for example. Now, I'm just saying all of that again. That is a part of the rational argument against the music. 
that what it leads to. That even innocently, if someone is just trying to feel better, they're just trying to be, be soothed, feel calm, comfort, happiness, change their mood. Um, what happens over time, the heart becomes attached. And they cannot find that satisfaction from the Book of Allah. And this should be our first place to go. But we, it's not there. It blocks. Some of the scholars even say it, the heart cannot contain both. And when you find yourself, and I find myself, having a confident inability to memorize, it's directly related to that. And you know, some of us, we heard, some of us, some of you, mashallah, I know, have worked hard to memorize, and memorize all or a lot of the Quran. And some of your teachers have mentioned to you the dilemma of Imam Shafi. Ooh, his memory was phenomenal. He had to cover half of a page because if he looked at a book like this, he would memorize the whole thing. It would get, it would get mixed up. So he had to cover half because he basically had a photographic memory. And he found himself not being able to memorize. And he, you know what he said? The reason why, right? He complained to a Wakir. It's a famous story. It's because he, he, he saw the bangle of a woman's ankle who women would wear on their ankle. He, he just saw this little bit of an ankle and it caused him to forget. How about us? He would lost his entire mind living in these days. And what are we exposed to? And you know, as well as I do, that music is attached to this, this attraction. One of the big things that sells and makes it drives the industry is the fact it's used as a means for people to get together. That some of the highest paid people, entertainers, they're filling concert halls and arenas. Why? Who's the fans? Who's in the front row? Who's filling the first front areas? You know, women. And for female artists, same thing. Or standing up in corner for artists, dancing. They don't usually just stand there in some, you know, um, conservative outfit standing there singing today. We know what they're doing. And the reason why that has an attraction. Because males are what they are. Human beings are what they are. Both ways. This is all evident, obvious. So, just I'm saying, I'm using this as an opening because this is where my background is that if we just use our rational observance of how music is used and what happens with it, we have to admit that it's used in ways that are definitely. Islamic, that are against Islamic morals and principles, which we should be about. If we believe Islam to be the correct way, if we believe it's akhlaq, it's morals to be the highest of morals, and we need to believe that we should as a matter of aqidah, because we believe our Prophet, وسلم, as he said, he was not sent except to complete the highest of character, the best of morals. We believe this. It's a matter of belief that our prophet was the best of humanity and he's our example. That if something contradicts that or undermines that or tears it down, it's something we should avoid. If it's something that takes us away from feeling close to the Lord, that is causing us to feel this tension and fight, then obviously it can't be something good for us or indeed. And you can't play a video game without music unless you turn it off. It's built in. 
When you go to sleep, when we watch television or we watch a movie, the drama, real life, do we hear music right now? But if it was a Hollywood production and they got the the uh, the 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 fiery what did, what did they call people? The when in the in the movies when a, when a Muslim is giving a speech or talking, you know, uh, the Mullah or the you know the firebrand preacher, we'd be hearing music right now <laughs> to accent anything I say, <laughs> whatever. It would be there. And subhanAllah, even Muslims these days, sadly, they're using this in their videos. They're using music to enhance it, to make it more exciting, to set a certain tone, to make it more dramatic. You know when the shark is coming, right? Right? There's a reason for that. You know when the gallon knife is around the corner, right? Everybody says, no, watch out, you know what's coming. Well, you know, when the guy's gonna come out with the roses in the line. In the film. Or you know, when the superhero was about to swoop down. Because the mood is set by the music. There's a science to this, folks. There's art and science to it. I can go on and on and on about this. But these are things that are self-evident. You know these things. You can ask yourself how much of an impact these things have on you. How much of an impact do these things have on my parents, my relatives, in my household, in my, in my, in my surroundings? I have, I've, I've met, I asked the brother, I said, have you, have you ever met anybody who never listened to music? Brother told me he met one person like this. And he's my age, he's in his 60s. He said he met one person like this his whole life. Muslims that never heard, never listened to music. I, maybe I guess people I don't know, I don't ask, go around asking anybody this question. But I haven't met people, unless they somehow were blurted out, who haven't been touched or influenced by it. SubhanAllah, I hate to say this, but I'm not going to mention it. When I went to Egypt, in fact, and I had a, 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 a teacher, and may Allah forgive me, have mercy on him. I don't even know what happened to him. He was half of Quran. He was a Shaykh of Qira. And he would sit there trying to teach us Arabic and how to read the Quran. And one day he asked me, Do you know Lionel Richie? I like, I like me some Lionel Richie. What shit? Oh my. It, it surprised me. I was, but that shows how extensive American culture is. Right? How pervasive, how far reaching it is. And how when you see certain people, they make certain assumptions. And I would hear things and see things that I would just, it, it made me realize I, I never fully understood when I heard about, when I hear people talk about the West. I really didn't understand what they talking about the West, the West. They keep blaming things on the West until I went to the East. <laughs> and then I started to see the influence. I said, oh, now I get it now. You just don't get it. So anyway, getting back to the point of I'm saying this to to bring home to us, let's be real about how deep and how much impact this has upon us. And I think even before we get to the technicality of the evidence for or against, we can see much as against it straight away. I would be the last thing I mentioned before mentioning this. I was at the Eid. And you know, this is a sign of the Eid not being accepted of a person. And some of the scholars tried to warn us against this on Eid Day. That it was a time for happiness and festivity, but in a halal way. But I was in a park. I was away from here. 
It was another place. But I was in a park, and I was sitting talking to an old friend, and having conversation or anything. And I look over here, and I see some young people twerking, shaking it, putting it with selfies, because they're posting it. And I'm saying to myself, what am I, what? They had no clue. I mean, or they didn't care. I don't know. But right there, me, on the heat ground, everybody knows. We just sit talking, old folks, and I'm saying, I'm just waiting, where's a parent at? There's a parent going up here somewhere. Because if I step up and say something, folks, I'm going to be like the crazy man. So it's going to be like, who are you? And this is the problem, you know. Sometimes we don't, we don't have to be mean to our youth. We're not going to go up here and say, you idiots, I like that. No. That's not the way to talk to people. But come on. On a day, we have to teach. We have to say, look, this is it's not appropriate. You, you, you guys look beautiful. MashaAllah, may Allah reward you, but this is not right right now. Don't do this. It's embarrassing. And then, right there, shows the influence, right there. Because where, where you get that move from? Where'd you see that move? Where'd you see those movements and those generations? You know when you saw it. It wasn't from a Quran and Hadith. It wasn't from Salah sitting in the masjid. It wasn't from Halakat. It wasn't from the Halakat of Dikr. It was from sitting there watching TV, watching YouTube, Watching TikTok. Come on, folks. We know this. So I'm saying, I'm trying to make a point that even without getting into the Islamic specifics of the ayat and the hadith, you right already know. A lot of this, if not all of it, is known. And when Muslims attach themselves more to the sound of the Qari than the message that the Qari is reading, that's another issue. But some people have asked about this. We were encouraged to recite the Qur'an in a beautiful manner. And we are attracted to people who, attract, who, who recite beautifully, right? But the problem is, it shows how powerful it is. Some people, they are more attached to the, the, to the Qari's voice them what the Qari is transmitting, which is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why you were here. And this is a whole issue. I got about punishment in hellfire. Hard, harsh, scary I get. And the people go, Allah, Allah, Allah. Because they're hearing the voice, not the message. Those I had should be like head down about to cry. Fear. But it's all about the voice of the person. And some people have become you know, celebrities for this. And people with nice voices are putting out tapes and videos. But what about the message of the Quran itself? And yes, the Quran is melodic, but it's not to be made a melody of. You don't make a song out of it. There are rules. rules. But some scholars criticize some of the Quran because it becomes more of a song and the message gets lost. This is how deep music is, folks, and singing. Amen. There's a line. And there's a complaint that I've made and heard from people here. They, they're like, well, some, how come you're saying, some people are saying certain people from certain cultures, it's like the music, okay, if it comes from here, but it's not okay if it comes from there. So, if it has a certain style of, or a certain rhythm or a certain tone, then you're like, I'm going to be that stuff for Allah. But if it comes from where they come from, it's like, we enjoy that. 
This is wrong. Because what I said earlier, certain things have a heavy, you know, attraction to bend your culture. It's not, a, but it should be a double standard. We're not going to give an Islamic ruling for one and not for the other if they both fall under the same category. So, um, I'm going to suggest a couple of things. Um, I mentioned the book of our brother, uh, Abu Badal Sabah Kennedy, who was saying, I mentioned that he's a brother, student of knowledge, by him all He wrote the streets called Islamic Ruling of Music and Singing. I suggest you download it. Because it goes through in detail about the ayat that claim to indicate the legality of music, and then the ones that indicate the prohibition. So he's being fair. He does an analysis. And so you can see for yourself. And then he goes into hadith. There's a very famous hadith in Sahih Bukhari that's used to talk about the prohibition of using instruments. You know, and my has it that some people try to cast aspersions upon it. There's some weakness in it. So he analyzes, he brings forth all of the hadith related to the issue. And then he brings the consensus of the companions, the tabi'i, the imams and the fuqaha, the special, the people who specialize in Islamic rulings. So he shows you, he establishes an historic continuity of their position. And the Jubhul, the vast majority, in fact, none of the four events uh, allowed it. So he goes to Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed, Imam Hamad. And then he does bring, to be fair, those who approve of singing. But he shows both sides. And then he brings some exceptions to when times, there are times when singing is allowed. And there's an instrument that is allowed, the duff. The duff is like a tambourine without the rings. So he shows that this is evidence that sometimes pointed to for the allowance. Because the prophet himself said, factually, no, no doubt, allowed the singing of the little girls during Eid. And allowed them to eat the duff. Um, there are times when to encourage the people to get them revved up for battle during jihad. But again, not with the truth. Um, the wedding feast. There's times when some singing is allowed, the use of the dust. And he brings evidence for that. And some other occasions. So he looks at that critically. And then at the end, he starts to, he, he mentions, you know, what is considered musical instruments, what is singing, what's allowable, not allowable. And, um, what goes along with it, the dancing professions, um, what should the position of Muslims be regarding it, how it affects us and the, uh, our impacts as far as encouraging sin or being away from sinfulness and how important or being away from sinfulness is. Um, he gets into the issue of alternatives because many of us Listen to Anashid, right? Islamic, quote unquote, Anashid. Some have maybe taken it too far in the opinion of others, and, and, and there's a reason for that. There's some guidelines to that. Many scholars don't like it, even if it doesn't contain bad lyrics, because of its closeness to other forms of music. But there's some do allow it, as long as it doesn't contain any bad lyrics, and if it's not showing off, if it's not using instruments, okay, if it doesn't incite certain passions, 
Det er meget værd. Um, you know, um, so that's an alternative in other words. And then um, he comes to a conclusion. I suggest this book, even though it's, it's a book, I think you gotta read it. But I think it's easy to digest. There's another book which I suggest if you want to get super detailed, like history, who said what, when, the depth of arguments is this one called Slippery Stone. And I recently got this just a couple of years ago. I think it was uh, published um, just a few years ago. Anyway, the other brother, uh, Elard Roy, uh, first edition was 1429, 2008, and 2011. So it's been out for about over 10 years. But this is a very comprehensive argument here, if you're interested. And I encourage you, always encourage you to read for yourself. So it brings all of the things that Mr. Kennedy does, plus, okay, gets into the arguments of people of different sects who say this and that, they bring them both the merits, they have different arguments for or against. And then this one is interesting. Um, it's also an in-depth study through Islam and science, it talks about the effects of music and so forth, and it's called The Music Made Me Do It. So I'm, I'm telling you these as references, inshallah, to pick up. If you're interested, if you're studious, you're ready to sit down and read, and of course, online, um, there are certain sites like Islam QA, where you can, they go through the whole thing in depth. They bring the ayat, the hadith, and so forth. Um, so I'm going to pause here. I know I've gone on too long. But as I mentioned, I, I wasn't here to get fatal. And I think everybody is very intelligent and very capable. I see almost every one of you guys, and I, and I know you're very, may Allah reward you I'm very happy to see you. And I know that you are capable. And I encourage you not to take shortcuts in your deed. Because ultimately, you have to know for yourself. You want to know things for yourself. And don't depend on people who can be wrong one day and right the next. And um, there was a couple of questions. I think actually I answered them inadvertently, along with best. And I, I, I mentioned that the, the position is a prohibition. So someone asked, if it's a prohibition, if it's haram, then should you stop going to malls, restaurants, bar shops, etc., etc.? Well, I, just think about the question, okay? Practically speaking, you can't avoid it. There's a difference, however, between hearing and actively listening. Correct? What do you hear then? You hear the rain. Right? That's music. <laughs> but you're hearing the rain. But you're listening to me, inshallah. Got it? So there's one thing when you're actively listening, but you can't, it's like you're listening to the news. You're listening to, you, you're, again, just going to the store. This one. Walking down the street, you are going to hear music. But do you have to stop and stop grooving? Oh, you don't. You know, you know if you're if you're coming across something, you know, you're, you're flipping the radio, or whatever it is, or going, you realize, you know, that if it's coming through and impacting you, you can turn it down. You know, you can avoid it. But sometimes, you know, even Films, even the film is beneficial. I, I, for example, personally, I love nature films. Personally, I like to watch that stuff. So people can't stand it. I like watching David Attenborough talk about and around the corner, it's coming. I like that stuff. <laughs> but the dramatic music is there. It's incidental. You don't intend to listen to music. So to that question, Practically speaking, you can't avoid that. So you, you're not blamed for it. Um, what makes the sheep not haram? Again, in 
general rules will allow it. I mentioned this already. If it doesn't contain rhythms or the type of music or melody that incites certain passions, so to speak, if it, if it takes away from the message itself, as long as the message, the lyrics are beneficial, nothing that's against the proper aqidah or akhlaq of Islam, then it should be okay. But anything that contradicts that, then it should be avoided. Someone asked um, how to listen to a lesson get out of your head, read more Quran. Remind yourself that, you know, what is a priority? And I had to do this myself. When I went to Egypt, I was listening to music. I, I had my Walkman, I don't know if you know what a Walkman is. I had a Walkman with my, my own music on it. My own big safe, which I would listen to while I was doing work. But I'm like, wait a minute, I can't do this as I'm trying to study Arabic and learn Quran. If it was directly catchy. So if I understand as a principle and believe that the Quran should be Rabia, Kurubi, or Kambi, right? That should be my wellspring. That should be what rejuvenates me. And this thing is blocking that. Then come on. I, I can't stick with this. I can't. Miles Davis got to go. Here's another issue. Culture. People argue that for music, based on culture. I know this very well. People argue about this. That a part of their culture, of their heritage, is certain types of music and musicians. And therefore, Muslim, and we accept Islam, our priority culture needs to be that which aligns with Islam. And if there's something within our own home cultures that contradicts that or undermines that, we have to be willing to let it go. We can't use that as an argument. What my parents or what our, our ancestors were upon, this is the same argument of the Mushrikun and the Bufar that's mentioned in the Quran. They were upon this. And Allah responds, He said, even though they knew nothing, they were ignorant. Call them ignorant. So I can't because my daddy was a musician, and because he had a great record collection. And I listened to that all my life. And I was taught to revere John Coltrane and Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie, or Frank Sinatra, whoever, whatever was your thing, or Earth, Wind, and Fire, or Stevie Wonder, or whoever, or these days, whoever, whoever, 50 Cent, whoever, I don't care, whoever it is, that's your culture, culture. No, if that culture contradicts Islam, if it feeds something that undermines Islam, then that's not your culture, brother, or sister, or sin. It's not, I'm sorry. We have to be honest about this. So we already talked about the whole issue. Is music completely haram, and why? And um, we talked about nasheed. So these are some questions that were, were given to me. Um, and inshallah, I hope I've answered them sufficiently for those who answered them. Inshallah, Taala, during the course of the of the talk. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I said I wanted to have more interaction with you guys, and I asked you maybe two, three questions only. And the reason for that is, uh, again, I start to think about many things as I started to speak, and a lot of recollections. But have you? I asked you. Have you read? Have some of you actually taken time to sit? Read about this. Look for fatal with the rulings on it yourself. And a few raise your hands. Have you gotten and heard someone arguing for it? Or have you listened to videos or seen videos or I don't know, or heard audios that argue for music? Anybody? A few of you have. Okay. I definitely have. I definitely have. Did you feel that those arguments had weight? Like, were they substantial? Were you convinced that you felt like, oh, this, he's got a point, or she's got a point? 
I'm not putting you on the spot. Like I'm not putting the check mark. Okay, this is my guy. No. <laughs> I'm just asking, honestly, because I imagine some of you have run into this with friends, even you may have met people, acquaintances, acquaintances or friends that argue for music. Have you had that experience? You yeah. have? Okay. How about family? Some of you families listen to music. And I don't mean this to, to point you to expose this sin, but the point is, I think you guys, some of you, you know, was, it's a, not easy. I'm trying to say to you that I understand that struggle sometimes. Especially when you're dealing with people who are close to you, or people who you respect. Or otherwise, you think highly of them. But they have this issue. They listen to music. I have good friends. People that I, I really feel close to. Muslims. But they, got, they, have, they still attach to that. They, they, they are still very attached. On this issue, we, we part. So people ask, how do you deal with that? Well, it doesn't mean you have to be rude. Or every time you see them, you have to jump on them about it. You know. But a deen and a sitha. The deen is advice. And if you can find a opportunity or a moment after you've learned the ruling, and that's why I suggest you have to read, you'll understand the ayat and hadith and the rationale as we talk mostly about the, the underpinning sort of wisdom sort of, of avoiding music, then you can say something that's pertinent or relevant. But you gotta believe it yourself. If you don't believe it, if you're not convinced, then you're not gonna do it. If you feel some reluctance or shyness about it, you're not gonna do it. I'm saying you have to reinforce yourself with knowledge, with anything. So I can't say emphasize enough the importance of you learning the ayat and the hadith in particular. And then you can just go further, as I said, what did the scholars say, what were their different positions and so forth. But many people don't have the patience for that. It, it does take a little effort. And I hate to say sometimes that the lack of Patience for that is due to listening to music for many people. Like they can't sit with patience and read a book. They cannot read the details. It's very difficult for them to understand the rationale of Islam. That's why I took a, what, 15 minutes, 10 minutes talking about the basis of Islam in the beginning. Because even this they argue. I'm sorry, but there are people, Muslims, who do not agree with that basis. Especially the part about the statements, the actions, the priority of the first generations of Muslims, the Sahaba, the Tagarim, and the Tagatarim. They actually philosophically say those people were Islam, were Bobir Ahlam. The latter people are Ahlam, meaning the earlier generations, their Islam is better, the latter generations, their knowledge is better. This is a false, bottom statement. It is falsehood. You can't have better Islam than have worse knowledge. Lack. What they're confusing is that, yes, people have gained more scientific knowledge as centuries have gone by. We've been exposed to more things. We certainly are far oh, ahead in ways that people in the past couldn't imagine even a hundred years ago. As far as technology, our knowledge of, the, of sciences and the body and biology and so many things. That is true. But don't confuse that with knowledge of the deen. Don't confuse that. The religion of Islam and the rulings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are meant for all times and places. And it's not for certain people and not for others. It's for all of us. All of the believers. All of those who would fear Allah. Um, like, I don't know if what I've said tonight has been
convincing or helpful to you tonight. I hope it has been to some degree. I try to avoid questions. <laughs> I'm stalling because I'm trying to Thanks, Chris. But if you have a question, I think we have like five minutes. Yeah. If you have a question, there's five minutes. So, so whoever. So I have a question, uh, whether you can, I guess, maybe give your, if, if it's going to be your personal opinion, then I guess I would take that as well, but trying to understand what to do in certain situations, say one of them you mentioned, say you have family that you know who listens to you or something like that, mm -hmm. and say you're asked to go to events which you know that are specifically going to have large amounts of music and music is going to be one of the focal points of that. How do you deal with, I guess, your family in that situation and yourself and that whole process? Right. Uh, did everyone hear that? Did you hear that question? Okay. So a lot of this depends on your who you are and where you are in this. Now, most of you are young adults here. So actually you are at the age of, most of you, independence. If you felt strongly about any issue, I think you know this already, and you've done this. If you feel strongly about an issue that you're not going to do something, have you not disputed with your parents about it? You have. You've, you've resisted. Maybe the most polite of you, the most polite ones of you are passive aggressive. You ain't moving that fast when it's time to do something. And these are not petty matters. I'm talking about small matters we like this. Big matters, this is a bigger matter. We are ordered not to be, uh, uh, we, are, oh, we are ordered to command by Allah against Shahadat Zur. Witnessing falsehood and wrongdoing. We are ordered by the Prophet Sallallahu to we see an evil, change it with our hand, and if not, with the tongue, and if not, then hate it in the heart, and that is the weakest of the men. So, if you really, and I guess if you find yourself, your parents are insisting, and we know we're also supposed to be dutiful to our parents, but we want to be respectful towards them all, all times. But maybe they're going to place like this that you mentioned. You know, uncles or aunties or who knows, wedding or whatever. And they, then you're in a tough position because you don't want to be disrespectful toward them. You're going to start a big fight. What is the greater or the lesser evil here? You see, you can, in this case, Allah's best, go along with them to the place that you don't have to hang out. Just like what happens, we see in many a function. Stuff is going on inside, and the youngsters are outside. You can avoid it, and people will get the message. You don't have to be rude, and you don't have to be mean. But what's better before all of this happens, before this situation comes up, is to talk about the issue. You see, if people know where you stand before that, they won't put you in that position. Many times, even your own parents, or people who are close to you, if they, if they know that this is your position in advance, they're not going to put as much pressure on you, in general, along the best. And I'm saying, I'm saying this from personal experience. Like, I've been a Muslim for a while now, so my relatives, they know they don't ask them to go to certain places. And I still have decent relations with them. They realize, they certainly realize by now it's not a passing phase. As they may have thought at one time. So they know that, that this is my position. I'm not going to do this, that, or the other. The same thing for any of us. So I'm saying, at times away from this, when it, before it gets heated or emotional or gets to a critical point, if there's a point to discuss these types of issues, 
then that's one angle. If you find yourself still, as I mentioned, you know, you're, you're compelled. You're compelled. You don't want to, again, start a fight, a problem, a bigger issue, because that's a bigger issue, right? Wouldn't you say? That if you, if you, um, we're not supposed to obey, there's no ta'a, the makhluk, the makhluk, there's no obedience to the created and disobedience to the creator. So if one's parents, and you can remind your parents in particular, or anyone, if they order you to do that which Allah has forbidden, you don't have to obey them in that. And the Quran itself obliges them as believers to this. We all read these same ayat. Okay? You're supposed to be a companion to them in what is good and obey them in what is good. If they ask you to do that which is wrong, you don't have to obey them in that. If you have a position in Islam to stand upon. And it's a, it's a, it's, it takes some maturity and patience. Because sometimes people insist. And so in that case, you know, try to fight and get into an argument. You try to stand your ground. And most of the time, in my experience, what I've heard from others, people respect it. But if you find yourself in that situation, you distance to the degree you can. You don't indulge in the, in the, festive, in the festivities as intensely or with others. You know, you have to kind of back off. And it happens all the time. People find themselves in these situations all the time. So the thing is to just try to distance yourself as much as you can. And people get the message. They realize. And if you are in a position of status, especially if you are a student of knowledge, they know that you're serious about your religion. You take it seriously. People respect you. They respect it. They, they, see, they give a hard time. They may grumble a little bit. They may tease you. The people get teased all the time. Who do you think you are? Or you're all pious now. Those things, some harsh things can be said that hurt your feelings. Okay? So the thing is to be firm but polite. And, you know, this is why some, you know, believe me, the demands, the leaders of the community get invited to these things all the time. And they'll smile and they'll say, and they'll make an excuse to get out of it. Or if they just want to show up, they can make a message. Our brother's not so is here. Or brother so and so was here when he left. He gave some hands. He gave congratulations to the happy couple. And then he come. You understand? So you, you just try to not keep yourself in a situation where you're oppressed. You know, when your religion, your deen, your emotional and psychological or spiritual state is being, you know, uh, impacted negatively. You know, and, and Allah rewards you for your patience. Allah Allah. Part of it is very specific about 
you know, how people will come along a time, and in this particular hadith, there will come a time when people will make halal the use of musical instruments, zina, which is illegal, illicit, sexual relations, and the drinking of alcohol. So he actually, you see in this statement of the prophet, which is one of the strongest evidences against it, he's equating it with those two things that are clear of us. Like the gambling and the alcohol is clear, right? Nobody disputes. But you can imagine at the time when this ayat came, that was deep, that was the people's culture. So when they realize you, actually the first ayat was, don't approach the prayer when entum sukara, and you are intoxicated. You're not a clear mind. That was the first hint. So remember what I was talking about those nails in the coffin for myself? It's the same type of thing. You realize this is not good for you. It's impacting you. You can't stand in the prayer. You can't even concentrate. You know this is not right. So when the time came and the ayats came down, some companions had a cup in their hand to their mouth, and they got the word that this came down they threw it down and spit it out on the spot. Start to break the vessels and the, the streets flow with wine. SubhanAllah, look at the attitude. So it's not a denial that there's some goodness or some benefit, if you will, in it. But the evil and the harms are greater. So keeping this in mind, you know, Allah doesn't make anything harm except that it is harming. And he does not make anything halal except that there's benefit in it. And if one leaves off something that is haram for the sake of Allah, he will replace it with something better for you. Keep that in mind, inshallah. It's time of Fasalah, inshallah. Oh, the sister here. Now she has a question. But then it's time for Adhan. So the, the, the call is. So how about this? Do you guys want to continue after Salah? Sorry? Do you guys say that? I mean, if it's fine for you, we can continue after Salah. So you guys agree? Is it time for that? Yeah, it's time for that. Sorry, Mishnah. So you end it here for today, Inshallah. Um, this Shoulder to shoulder is happening every month, once every month, so please make sure to attend. Um, I just want to clarify that Brother Abdul Qadir in his long lecture, he addressed all the questions which were given to us through the registration form. So if you have any question in the future, please make sure when you're registering, you ask those, ask, ask those questions, because those questions are going to priority uh, before you come here, inshallah. Uh, we are also going to reward all of you for coming out. Uh, may he accept from us and from you all. Uh, may he benefit from this discussion and may he allow us to benefit from this talk. And uh, we will see you soon, inshallah. Jazakumullah uh, khair. There is some food for you guys after salah, so please uh, make sure to stick around and um, eat together, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.